Do it with me. Wax on, wax off. Come on, it's not a trick. Wax on, wax off. One more time. Wax on, wax off. Congratulations, 360 Church has certified you as a Kung Fu fighter. You can take on anybody on the street. <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, I hear this mysterious <coughs> crackling, popping sound coming from the front wheel of my bicycle. That's a big deal to me because I, I, I ride every day, and so... I took the wheel off the bike and walked into Missing Link, which is one of our great local bike shops, and uh, the bicycle doctor there uh, pointed out to me that the problem wasn't loose spokes, which is what I thought, but the problem was the hub of the wheel itself, the place where all the spokes come together, which is kind of a bigger deal. He took the wheel out of my hand without even being asked, and he started to disassemble the hub just on his own, out of the goodness of his heart. I was so impressed by that. And he, he gave me the, the bad news, which was, my home is really cheap. <laughs> and so it's open to the outside and all kinds of stuff gets in there. And the grease inside it looks just like chocolate pudding. That's in very bad shape. And the worst news is, it's a terminal condition. And the new wheel that he could sell me would cost about $100. And so like getting a terrible diagnosis at the hospital, he decides to clean the patient up, stitch it back up, and send it home. So he cleans out the bearing, he loads some uh, green grease in there, hands it back to me, and I put it uh, back on my bike, and uh, it worked so great for about one day. This, on day two, it's crack, pop, crack, pop, crack, pop, crack, pop, and I know my bearing is just, it's going. And so as a result of that, I have this thought, if he can repack a front wheel bearing, I can do it. And so I went home to that source of all wisdom, truth, and knowledge, which is YouTube. And I binged on do-it-yourself videos on how to repack the bearing on your front hub, because I admire craftsmanship deeply, and when I saw what this guy was able to do, I thought, it'd be cool to be able to do that. And so I watched probably 10 videos because I'm a maniac about this kind of thing. And uh, I took my wheel back off and I went down to right on the edge of the water where the Waterside Bike Shop is. That's the group we partnered with to buy all those bicycle helmets for last Christmas for marginalized kids, just great people. And they have a free repair space. So I took my wheel in, I used their free rack, I used their free tools, I used their free mechanics. Uh, and I found myself uh, with a 14 millimeter cone wrench in one hand and a 17 millimeter box wrench in the other hand looking just like I knew what I was doing. Because if you're a guy, looking like it is most of the ball game. So I pop the thing off and I unpack the thing and uh, inside uh, I pull everything out, I, I, I clean it all up and, and I, I bolt it back together and it only took me 90 minutes and I only installed one part backwards, which the mechanics helped me with. Put it all back together and now my bearing is pristine and I am rolling like a boss. But in the course of the rebuild, I've discovered that two of the parts inside are so worn out that they will eventually destroy the bearing no matter how much of that beautiful blue grease that Waterside uses I jam in there. There's just no way that that's going to give it eternal life. It is mortal and it's bound to die. And so my, th my thought is now what I'm gonna do is take it to the next level. I'm going to get all the tools I need and I'm going to completely rebuild the thing with new parts and then I'm going to be, well, awesome is the word. And so I buy uh, a 14 millimeter cone wrench from Waterside. I order ball bearings and grease from Amazon, which arrives in just a couple days. And probably this afternoon, I'm going to go get the 17 millimeter box wrench and when I can figure out how to get the parts that are worn out, I'm going to make this thing function all by myself. And the reason I'll feel good about it is because in that exercise, <clears throat> I have developed the capacity to do something and the tools to do it. And I have learned to use the tools by doing something about it. In the last few weeks, our talks on Sunday mornings have been from the book of James. He writes in the middle of the first century, probably from the city of Jerusalem, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And he writes words designed for believers in Jesus who are scattered all over the Roman Empire and who are having a really tough time. Would you agree with me that when things are really tough, it's, it helps to hear from somebody? That's kind of the purpose of this letter. He's throwing out a lifeline of hope to people that are just, well, the culture around them is just beating them down. 
And so he, he's sending them encouragement and hope and faith and grace uh, through uh, the Spirit giving him these words to send to people uh, who are in that situation. His writing revolves around the concept that we're calling true religion, uh, which is to say that faith should have the effect of forming not just belief, but of forming conduct on the outside of us. And when we have that kind of conduct that is rooted in faith, then we've got a religion that really makes sense. And he defines it real specifically in chapter 1 of his letter, in verse 27, where he writes this, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. And he's saying, if you're doing stuff like that, that's the real deal. Now, the beliefs, the faith, the doctrines, those all count too, because they're the foundation of everything. But what makes it true and real and whole and genuine is how it works itself out in the world, because your faith simply makes that happen. So his whole book is built around that, and we've looked at several of the components of true religion. We've talked about counting joy instead of chasing happiness. We've talked about wisdom as a spiritual discipline and instead of what I refer to it as Jesus Google. We talked about taking half a step toward people who aren't like us instead of pulling back that half a step that separates you in that, in that subtle way. And last week, Jen spoke on controlling the most dangerous force in the universe, which is our own words. <laughs> oh, baby. Uh, true words never spoken. All of those are the kinds of things that go into making a religion that is, is the real deal. Now, James is teaching us not that we come to God by doing these things. He's teaching us that Jesus has brought us to God, and because of that new relationship, we're now able to do things like this and to live out Jesus in the world through these kinds of components. Now, that's a fine theory, but how do you develop the capacity to do it? Where is the cone wrench? Where are the tools? Where is the free workshop and those KG free mechanics who will answer my foolish questions world without end? <laughs> there is no limit to how many times that will help me. It's like, it was like, it's like being in the living presence of the grace of God, no matter how foolish I am, how ignorant I am, how, my, how, how, how many parts I install backwards. They just keep coming with the love and the love and the love, and they give me the answers, and they make me look like a genius by the time I left. That's a religion I can live with. In verse 22 of chapter 1, James talks about what we might call developing our religious capacity. He says this, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away, and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. He draws a sharp contrast between hearing and doing, which is really common in James. He often operates by contrasting two competing ideas. That's his, his basic mode of presentation here. And uh, as I, I looked into the meaning of the original language and this was in which this was written uh, and the nuances that that provides, which are many, we could paraphrase this verse with these words. Make sure you continue doing the good news without being like the people who attend public lectures in your city and listen without ever becoming a real follower. Because they are cheating themselves by using a false form of reasoning that says religious information by itself is enough. Using that reasoning, you miss the point. Well, what is the point? James uses a simple metaphor to describe this distinction between simply hearing the word and acting upon it. And it's the metaphor of the mirror. He says in verse 23 that if you look intently into a mirror, and, and the word here means uh, to stoop down as if to uh, 
gaze on something that's really super important to you, that you actually change the posture of your body to see what, what is that thing. It's the same word that's used to describe the people who went to the tomb of Jesus on Resurrection Day and stooped down and looked intently and it's searching for the Lord. It's, it's that kind of intensity, somebody that, that really pours themselves uh, into looking. There's a recent survey in the UK that reported that men spend an average of 53 minutes a day looking in the mirror. <laughs> that men will use any reflective surface, even if it's not a mirror. That men spend five minutes a day on average looking at themselves in car mirrors, not just the one above the dash, but the ones outside the doors. That they spend another five minutes a day looking at themselves in reflective surfaces, like windows in front in the, in the front of stores that that's an hour a day that is that is, means that if, if this applies to the u.s that guys in britain are spending an entire year of their lives looking at themselves in the mirror looking intently stooping down to see i mean can you pass one without looking i don't think anybody can male or female there's something about that reflective services you got to see man is, am I, did i have broccoli in there you have to find out how how you're doing, and it's the way we check up on that. It's that it, it's that same kind of a sense of, 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 of looking really intently and, and, and being completely invested in it because we just can't get enough of ourselves. And yet there's a distinction between that and being able to remember what we just saw. And that's the distinction that he's drawing. A, a hearer uh, looks and forgets at once. Or one scholar paraphrases it this way, just a glance and off he goes. Just a quick check, boom. And there are a couple of sensible reasons for that. One is that uh, ancient mirrors were made originally, uh, well, originally they were people looking into water. And then they were polished stone. And by the time the Romans came to rule the, the Mediterranean basin, mirrors were polished metal. In the case of the one we're showing you here, this is a first or second century bronze mirror from the, the Roman era. This would all be made as smooth as possible and people would look into it for the same reason we would do today. But you know, the kind of clarity and acuity you're going to get from that is, is just not very good. And so a simple reason why you can't remember why you see in the mirror is because the mirrors were such poor quality, they didn't really show you very much detail. So it's kind of a a logical thing and the second reason is it's really hard to retain everything that you see you know 75% uh, of the people who have been convicted of rape and murder in the United States and later found out to be innocent were all convicted on the basis of eyewitness testimony people who saw and forgot it's just extremely uh, unreliable in many situations and so you have not only the problem with the technology it's not clear enough you have the problem with the neural wiring which is it's just not made to take photographic snapshots unless you're a very exceptional person of what you've seen in the mirror and so normally when I've heard people teach this verse uh, the, the way they've taught it is uh, the scriptures are kind of a like a cheese grater and if you put yourself up against them enough they'll sort of tear the sin right off you. <laughs> they'll, they'll just filter the sin right out of you because when you look into the, into the Bible, what you'll be able to see is all your faults and failings. You'll be able to feel terrible, and once you feel terrible about how awful you are, you'll be able to tell God how sorry you are about your terribleness, and then he'll do something to help you get over that and be less terrible the next day. That's 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 quite a stretch from the original metaphor here. The original metaphor is it's very natural and very simple. He's just saying, hey, when you look in a mirror, how much do you remember a week later? Oh, you mean it's just how people are. He's not saying it's because you're taking a casual attitude towards the word and then walking away and deliberately stepping uh, out of it because you just don't care and, and you're off. Although that is a live option. There are people who have that attitude for sure. But in, in the mainstream of our experience, it's been much more the natural approach to the metaphor, which is it's just, you know, it, it, that's just what happens when you, when you look at something like this. What was the sermon about two Sundays ago? I don't even remember. I mean, it just, you walk away from the mirror and you go, that's why I keep notes, because I can't keep it all in my mind. 
Uh, and, and this is the human condition, isn't it? We, we look into something, we mean well, we want it to work, we want it to happen in our mind, and when we walk away, we go, ah, was wisdom part two or part four? Oh, we're just not angels. We're people. And so we look into that, and it's not meant to be a lie detector. It's not meant to invoke amnesia, but it has those effects on us. And so it turns out to be harder to act on what you know than it seems like it should be. In the corporate world, this is referred to by some people as the performance paradox, where it's been widely documented that highly educated, highly trained, very bright, very capable managers turn out to be almost incapable of doing what they know they should do. And so the answer by most corporations to that is to hire a very expensive consultant who will deliver a report and oftentimes, when that report is delivered to the corporation, the consultant in the due diligence research finds out that there have been five or six other consulting reports that have all been filed, some of them enormous and very well done, and no action has been taken on any of them. Now, people who have been researching this phenomenon have found that there are problems much deeper than just a lack of information, because if information solved everything, we wouldn't have the issues that we have, not just in the corporate world, but in, in our, our own lives. If just knowing got the job done, then all we would need to do is pour Bible words into our ear using an iPad, an iPhone, or a, an old-fashioned, you know, actual hard copy book. And once we poured the words into our ear, we would just automatically act on them. That is not my experience. Is that your experience? I mean, knowing those words is really important. The knowledge of the scripture really does count. For one thing, to know uh, who God is and to know how Jesus has come and what he has done for us and to know that accurately and faithfully. We do have to know the content of the Bible and also because it's just lovely. I mean, if you're completely outside of any faith in God but you have an aesthetic sensibility, you should just read it because it's beautiful. It's just I don't just like it. I, I love the Bible, and one of the reasons I love it is because it's just it's just beautiful. It's just aesthetically magnificent, and it, it, it's gripping of the heart. But on a, a more practical level, how do we translate what we know into what we do? In verse 25, James puts it this way, But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. But if we turn things around and thought not in terms of knowing equals doing, with an asterisk that knowing is critically important for many, many, many reasons, but rather than relying just on that, what if we added a second idea, which is that I know when I do. Here's some action steps for you. From verse 25. Number one, read slow. When you read the Bible, read it slow. I think you're better off reading shorter portions of it if you can take more time to just slow down. Knock off the Red Bull if you need to. Just slow. Because when you read slowly, you focus more and the words start to work their way into your heart. The scripture talks about hiding the word in your heart. Read slowly. You know what happens to me? This is just subjective. This is just a personal experience. But sometimes when I take my own advice and I read very slowly, it's almost like the lines start to open up and you can sort of feel the heart of God that's behind just the words themselves. Now the words matter. But you can feel that presence. You can feel that transforming power. When you read slowly, you're looking deeply into the law of liberty. Read slow. Here's the second action step. 
act now. If you read something, take something in that gives you the uh, option or the obligation to take a certain step that you have the opportunity to do that, take that opportunity. Here's an example. Like this week, I could take the action step of not roughing anybody up. You know, like somebody cuts in line in front of you at CVS. <laughs> you ready to throw down, baby? <laughs> this is California. This is some outsider, somebody from somewhere else who doesn't understand about lines. You do not do that, or I will smack your face. You know, those are all the spiritual things that well up inside me. Uh, I could just act on that by just keeping my mouth shut. But you know, you don't always have an opportunity like that every day. What about the, the, the rest of my life? We read slowly, we act now, and I think the third step is repeat. Yesterday I was uh, biking to the holy place where I do what is usually about the fourth edit on, on uh, these Sunday morning talks, and I pulled up to a red light, and uh, I was feeling good about my position uh, in the street because I'm all the way over to the left, so people who want to go right on red can pass me and turn. Uh, I'm inside all the painted lines, so I'm safe and I'm legal. Uh, I have a bright blue helmet on, a yellow fluorescent vest, and flashing lights front and rear. In other words, I am dressed like a circus clown, but I'd rather be a live clown than a, a dead cool guy. You know, people pull up and say, it's a shame he's dead, but wow, look at that outfit. You know, that's how I see the alternative. And so I'm, I'm feeling really safe and legally good. And then I see this huge gray shape emerge from my left. And it is a man driving a gigantic, way too big, obviously not from Berkeley, planet-smashing pickup truck that seems about 14 feet high to me. And he is slowing down at the curb to turn to his right, which is going to bring him within just a couple of feet of me, because I'm pretty much up close to the center line, and so as he's swinging around, he's got the window down, and I hear him raining invective down on my head. He is cussing and swearing and just bombing me left and right, and his concern is not that I am going to be mashed into the pavement, no. His concern, best I can make it out between all the F-bombs, is that when he hits me, my bike is going to scar the huge, beautiful, expensive chrome hub on the front wheel of his vehicle. And we're back to Hobbs. I'm thinking this kind of concern for your fellow man is deeply moving. You know, I, I would be so sorry that in the process of being killed, my bicycle would scar the lovely chrome uh, on your, th your hub that costs more than my car does. He swings by, the invective continues, and behind me from my left ear, I can hear him pull over to the curb and stop and get out. I didn't see him, but I, I heard him. And now I'm thinking to myself, what happens if this turns into a road, road rage incident? What am I going to do if he confronts me? Despite the fact that I'm in a legal position, what am I going to do if his confrontation becomes aggressive? I have 10 seconds. The light in front of me is red. There is no escape. Now bring that to your reading the Bible. Rather than just pouring the words into our ears, we could start with talking to God about what our life has been before we begin to read. Lord, yesterday, you just won't believe what happened. This guy in this huge gray truck almost ran me over. He said so many bad words. It was, I was scared to death. I thought if he didn't kill me with the truck, he was going to get out with a handgun and shoot me down. I was going to end up in a chalk outline on the pavement. Lord, what, how can this happen? Aren't I supposed to be operating under the blessing of God here or something? Doesn't the card in my pocket say pastor? Is, shouldn't that be worth some kind of protection or something like that? Now I have your word here. And I really need you to talk to me. I really need you to talk to me. When I do, then I know. When I do, 
then I have tools and I have capacity. It was my decision. I decided to apologize, no matter what he said. Was I legally in the right? Absolutely. Was he mean to me? Yes. I decided to apologize if he confronted me. I decided to apologize if the confrontation became aggressive. I decided to apologize if he knocked me down. Oh, I'm sorry, if I'd have stood in a different direction, it could have hit me harder. Sorry about that. Why? Because a soft word turns away wrath. And because if someone asks you for your sweater, you give them your hoodie too. Lord, thank you that you have, through Jesus, given us a new and living way to come to you. That we don't have to do a bunch of religious stuff to earn our way into a relationship or into your presence. And today, Lord, we ask you to uh, give us grace from the Holy Spirit, even if we are outside of faith, that we would bring our lives to you and process our lives through your word give you a chance to not just inform us, but to train us that your word is where our lives come to take meaning and shape, where we can grow and learn. Help us to hunger for that, to hunger to look deeply into it and to be changed as a result. We thank you. We pray, we pray all of that in Jesus' name. I'm going to ask you to stand with me if you would, please. And our band's going to come and just lead us in some worship for a while before our communion service. And as they do, we'll have a few prayer team members here to your left and right if you'd like to have someone pray with you in person. Uh, we'd love to be able to do that today. We'll do that in a way that you'll feel comfortable with. And during the worship time, just... Uh, this is just like the free bike shop. The tools are free. The, the machines are free. The grease is free. The mechanics are free. And they're always friendly. They're just always friendly. Whatever you need from the Lord today, you can just take that right to Him during this time. I let Him just speak to you and fix stuff and just, just help you and encourage you today to say, because of what Jesus has done, it's, it's all free.